Well, hello, everybody. Uh, and as you all know by now, the business aviation sector has been dealing with the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic for almost three months now, maybe a bit longer. And the industry has been exercising its characteristic flexibility, trying to maintain activity levels in the face of rapidly changing and sometimes quite confusing public health regulations and restrictions. And once again, I'm joined by Richard Coe, who is Managing Director of the Data Analysis Group, WingX, which tracks flight data to provide an accurate picture of what's happening worldwide. And just today, the company published some new data that shows that since the start of May, global business aviation activity has been down by around 47% compared with where it was about the same time last year. And in fact, looking more closely in the first nine days of June, the situation has improved somewhat in that traffic levels were only down by 34% compared with last year. So thank you for joining us again, Richard. And the last time we spoke was in late April. And I have to say the traffic data that you're reporting now uh, looks like an improvement. I mean, we were at even lower levels back then. So can we say that things have actually improved? And, and is it too soon to start getting uh, more optimistic about where things are heading? Yes, um, absolutely. They've improved, Charles, and that's got to be encouraging news. We're still talking about very significant relative declines to normal uh, normal business, of course. Yes. Um, as you say, business aviation, as in jets and turboprops, are flying uh, 34% less globally so far in June. So we've had nine or 10 days of June. Um, and if you go back to the start of May, uh, the, the the rate is almost sort of fifty percent below normal, um, so that's that's certainly an improvement. Because if you go back for April, um, business aviation flying was down about seventy percent, more than seventy percent at the low point. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're we're tracking, for example, the average uh, daily activity based on a seven day day rolling um, trend, and, and and that has more than doubled since its low point in April with respect to business aviation. And just to give you an idea of the resilience, if you if you look at commercial aviation, um, its activity is, is still down by 80% globally. Uh -huh. uh, that is the scheduled airline flights. And the share that business, just to give you an idea of the comparative resilience, business aviation before this crisis hit, had a share of all fixed wing activity of around about 12% globally. Mm -hmm. And that is now up to close to 30%. Mm -hmm. so, so business aviation has proven to be more resilient, certainly than scheduled airlines. And, and as we've just described, it's on an upward trajectory. So that is, that is definitely good news. That's excellent. Well, glad to hear that. And I'd like to get back a little bit later to this point about where this leaves business aviation, but that, that is reassuring. Of course, the situation across the globe is quite complex in terms of, of how the, the crisis is, is still unfolding. Um, it looks from your numbers as if the recovery has continued to strengthen in North America compared with other regions. Is, is that accurate? And do you have a feel for why that would be? Is it simply that they're, they're being a bit more aggressive in opening up the economy there in many states, of the US at least? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, North America, as, as we know, is the key global market for business aviation, it has at least 65% of the fleet, um, and it has the most mature market. And um, with it being so much more embedded than anywhere else as a, as a form of transportation, you, you would expect it to have more resilience in coming back. Uh, I suppose the counterfactual is that Europe is coming out of this virus, whereas the US and, and North America generally is, is still in, in, in the midst of the pandemic, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But that said, there have been, as you've alluded to, some states that have had a much softer suppression policy than others. And I think that that's why we've seen much stronger recovery in business aviation activity in, in, in states like Florida than, let's say, in California. Mm. Um, but overall, yes, I mean, you know, certainly the United States is, in essence, one regional market. Whereas if you look at Europe, you've got this myriad of different, you know, sovereign states. And um, and, and much as the EU is trying, there there is still a great deal of variety in suppression policies, which which have affected the, the recovery in any sort of international traffic. Yeah, that's a very good point. And of course, looking at Europe, one thing I've noticed is 
it, there's quite a complex situation there in terms of how the restrictions are working. Um, you know, some of them, some of these decisions seem to be taken on a, on a national level in terms of you know what individual states will allow. So, do you think perhaps that that sort of somewhat uh, spotty picture across the continent has has sort of complicated the recovery of business aviation in Europe in a way? Yeah, it's undoubtedly complicated it. But I think that if we look at it broadly, I think it's 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 still realistic to say that in Q3, we will see, certainly for, for the Schengen area, if not for the wider European continent, a, a broad recovery in, in inter-regional traffic, inter-country traffic, international traffic within that area. Um, I think it will be Q4 before we see intercontinental traffic coming back. Um, but broadly speaking, I, I think that the, the, the European Union is, is getting a handle on coordinating measures and to facilitate uh, traffic, which would be, you know, both for commercial and business aviation within certainly within the Schengen area. Yeah. OK, that's a good point. Now, of course, uh, on this side of the Atlantic, where we both are, you know, a further sort of spanner in the works, if you like, was was a decision taken by the UK government uh, from last Monday to impose a 14 day uh, quarantine requirement that was that was a pretty contentious decision and probably neither of us are well qualified to to say whether or not that was medically or scientifically justified but the you know the plain truth is it hasn't helped and and you know I get the impression the industry at least in the UK feels like it's being sort of kicked while it's down <laughs> in a way is that yeah. has that been a, a pretty serious problem at least for traffic in and out of the UK and if that carries on you know what sort of what sort of shadow could that cast over this recovery yeah well charles it's certainly reflected in the numbers we can see since monday this week the arrivals from outside the uk into the uk have dropped off precipitously we actually saw a surge in arrivals in the three or four days up to the 8th of june so clearly mm. that is business aviation arrivals so clearly people were coming back before the quarantine and 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 from monday the traffic immediately you know fell by two thirds and 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 it's it's down this week so just in terms of the numbers we would expect that um, that, that sort of blunting of, of what we'd seen as a recovery in the UK business aviation mm -hmm. um, to continue throughout the quarantine period. So it really depends when the quarantine period comes off. But, you know, the, the, the wider you know, repercussions are obviously pretty negative for British business because yeah. as, as, you know, all, all of our industry associations have said, this is, uh, this is a big sign that says Britain is closed for business during the quarantine period. And yes. of course, you know, these, these measures tend to get reciprocated by our, you know, continental partners who, who, who likewise say, well, whilst we may bring the barriers down for our neighbouring countries, for, for, for UK, for those coming from the UK, it's, you know, it's still a closed shop. Yeah, well, that's a fair point. And of course, there's been a lot of talk about will the UK government uh, allow the notion of some sort of air bridge or international uh, travel corridor, which, you know, there was a certain amount of suppressed sniggering with people saying, well, hold on a minute. I'm not sure it's going to be Britain's call whether it gets to establish these these uh, these air bridges, because the fact is the infection rate is actually higher in the UK. But uh, I suppose all that says is, you know, the industry just can't take it for granted that we're on an inevitable sort of smooth and upward trend now. And even going back to the US, I mean, yes, it's good news that traffic is picking up there. But by the same token, there are, there are now some concerns that the infection rate might be picking up in some states. And I suppose we have to keep our eye on the ball because, uh, you know, we could see restrictions coming back into force. But I agree. And uh, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I think we've seen a lot of good news. And I, I think the data is is, is telling us that the you know, at, at the moment, business aviation is recovering. So we could take that as an indicator that people are getting more confidence. Yes, of course, there's a lot of concern about, you know, the resumption of this pandemic, but we, we, we haven't seen that conclusively happen yet. And, and I think that broadly speaking, um, you know, we've suffered some terrible damage, but, but we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, very good point. And before we move on, I mean, how much do we know about what's happening in, in Asia and, and other major continents like Latin America? I know you, you track global data. What are you seeing elsewhere? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Oceania, as in Australia, New Zealand uh, and surrounding, you know, peripheral peripheral region to that, is actually, you know, really very resilient now. And as you know, that's because the virus was you know, completely suppressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly within that region, uh, traffic is back to close to normal uh, levels. Um, in, in, in Asia, 
uh, that's that's not so much the case. There hasn't been a great recovery since the since the tipping point in in February March. Um, a lot of the business aviation traffic uh, normally is international and for, for that for that region, and that traffic has been uh, you know uh, has severely declined uh, because it's 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 been it's been constrained by suppression policy more than anything else. So mm-hmm. we don't see that coming back anytime soon. I think in South America. Um, the the crisis is really unfolding. We haven't seen as big a drop in flight activity in South America so far, uh, but nor is it showing any signs of, of properly coming back. Yeah, that's a good point. And just quickly, worldwide, I mean, we've been focusing a lot on you know suppression efforts for COVID nineteen and the restrictions that come from that. But do you think maybe as the months unfold, we'll get a fuller picture on the of the impact on the charter market and, and business aviation generally? Of, of, you know, frankly, economic decline. I mean, the, the, the fact is the world economy is poorer than it was three or four months ago. There's less money going around. Mm-hmm. Even wealthy people, are in some cases, somewhat less wealthy. Do you think maybe, you know, we've still, we still don't have a complete picture of what that will mean in the long term? Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. I mean the OECD, uh, yeah, I think reported yesterday that next year's next year's economy, as in 2021, could be four percent smaller than than um, you know than, than 2019. So this is a really sustained and deep economic uh, recession, and business aviation has broadly tracked global GDP. Um, however, it hasn't only correlated to GDP. I think that there are other uh, you know that, that that there are other drivers for business aviation recovering or continuing to decline I think that you know there will be business opportunities whether that's you know foreign direct investments or, or mergers and acquisitions there will be a lot of consolidation executives will need to travel and they won't have the connectivity they used to have on commercial airlines so I think that there are certainly economic headwinds um, but there will be economic imperatives as well uh, for for business people to travel. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that business aviation will benefit from that. Good. OK, well, I certainly hope so. Um, the other thing that WingX's data is good at is sort of breaking down traffic by different sizes and, and, and performance levels of aircraft. So what have you seen in terms of trends, you know, f- for what types of aircraft are more demand in, in more demand than others at the moment? Mm. Well, Charles, broadly has reflected the um, the pattern of flight activity where uh, domestic travel has certain, certain, shown a certain amount of resilience, whereas, you know, international long sector travel has been severely, you know, depressed. So mm-hmm. what that means is that, uh, you know, the large large cabin long range jets, you know, the heavy jets, the ultra long range jets, uh, certainly the biz liners have, have been by and large you know, parked. I mean, activity levels are still down 60 or 70 percent from the start of May. Whereas the the mid-size sector, the super mid, the mid, uh, the super light has has done relatively better. It, it is it is offering a more sort of versatile cabin for the uh, for the shorter sectors now being operated. And I think that the, well, I can say that the data shows that the light cabins, uh, the very light, the entry level, and certainly the props have seen. 20 to 30 percent decline over the last few mm. weeks so that relatively puts them at, at the top of the tree and if you look at the busiest aircraft out there is the pc-12 the caravans the king airs um so whether that you know w- what motivation of traffic that reflects it's it's a mix that there there is clearly you know some diversion of, of bizav capacity to logistics emergencies repatriation ambulance and that's giving those aircraft a certain impetus um but you know for the for the uh, for, for the utilitarian uh, travel requests whether that's sort of charter or owner these aircraft are are, are right for the purpose at the moment. Yeah, that's a good point. So yes, the the pattern of traffic has changed in terms of less long haul stuff, but maybe some, um, particularly charter consumers, uh, are looking at the market and saying, "I'll just get enough aircraft for what I need. I don't, you know, I, if the PC twelve is all I need for that particular trip, that's what I'll fly in. I'll, I, you know, I won't go in a mid sized jet that I might have used last year, which is quite interesting. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the economic shock that you that you referred to is going to cause a you know a shakedown with um you know corporate flight departments getting rid of their aircraft quite possibly fractional customers you know moving away from that asset risk 
Um, and you know, ultimately, that means people dropping out of the market, which is not great for the industry. But it does also mean that some sort of you know fractional or, or full aircraft owners will move into the charter market, and, and they will look for you know aircraft on the spot market that simply do the job best and and, and cheapest. And, and I think that that will change the whole um, you know will change demand certainly in t- types of aircraft. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good point. Um, the other thing your data picks up on are individual airports. And of course, you know, based on the traffic uh, narrative we've described above, it's not surprising to see airports in places like Florida, uh, you know, d- doing better than, than other places, certain key yep. airports in the London area and New York area perhaps doing OK. Um, do you see much fluctuation in the traffic levels between airports around the world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's been it's, it's been really interesting. I mean, like you know, the Scandinavian airports have have have, and then this is when you bring in the sort of the turboprop activity. But mm-hmm. you know, have actually been you know some of them been flat or even growing compared to 2019 because of the clearly they're, they're taking on a lot of logistics travel, even though it's a business aviation aircraft. But you know, you've seen in the London area, Biggin Hill standing out as the busiest airport for much of the crisis period, which is which is certainly you know it's normally Rank, rank number three, um, and, uh, and 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 that's interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, it's a decision that airports have taken to stay open for business, and other airports have have decided that in the circumstances that they, 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 they should close. I mean, London City is mm-hmm. now reopening, but there's an example of an airport that simply, you know, closed the doors. Um, and you know, likewise in in, uh, in in the US, you know, we're seeing uh, West Palm Beach and, and Naples. These these are airports that are actually seeing even even more activity at the start of June than they did last year. Mm-hmm. Whereas Teterboro, which is yeah, everyone knows global number one airport um, is is still really suffering, uh, yeah. and, and that's bound to reflect the international traffic, which is which has disappeared for now. Yes, and the fact that the New York area itself has had it very hard in terms of the yeah, impact indeed. of the of the virus. Yeah. But yeah, those are that that's that really sheds a light on it. Well, and uh, you know, as you do your work, Richard, I'm sure you're in contact with a lot of people in the business aviation sector. Um, how would you sort of rate overall morale? I mean, these last three months or so have been really taxing for people in the industry on a personal level and in terms of some of the very hard business decisions they've had to take. How do you think they're doing? I mean, do do you think they're getting to the point where they think, okay, this is exhausting, but we can begin to see some sort of way out of this? Or do they almost not dare to believe that yet? Yeah, I I mean, inevitably, I do talk to more European operators and US operators. But I I think US operators are in a relatively better position. They've got, you know, a much, much deeper, more mature market. There's been much more kind of, you know, substantial government support. Including business jet operators. Um, in Europe, you've got a highly fragmented market. Uh, a lot of these operators, you know, have very little margin to work with anyway, and um, you know they, they've had to put quite a few of them have had to put um, uh, personnel on on furlough, and and we know that furloughs everyone furlough is going to run out. So mm-hmm. you know there's that cliff edge coming. I think that back when the crisis happened. A lot of operators were, were were hoping, were crossing fingers that the summer season would stay intact because that is such an important part of, of the European market, particularly when you look at the charter business. And and it looks like, you know, at best it's going it's it's gonna just a part of it is gonna come through the um, the lifting of regulations. And and of course the UK operators have have, have suffered you know, really going to suffer more more than others, um, due due to the extension of the quarantine. So, I, I, you know, the impression I get from talking to operators really pretty regularly is is really pretty downbeat. Um, I suppose looking forward six to twelve months, there's there's going to be you know such a shakeout in this sector with almost certainly a lot of exits. So, you know, perhaps you could look forward if you could hang in there to a consolidated marketplace that is, you know, that is disciplined, that possibly has some, you know, bigger scaled up carriers and and, and some opportunities. Certainly those are opportunities some of the larger cash rich carriers are probably looking at now. Yeah, very good point. And finally, you're trying to play your part at at WingX. I believe you've just uh, started a new partnership with the Air Charter Association to provide data to its members. Tell, Tell us about that and how you feel this data can actually be useful for companies as they try and sort of plot their course and, and take advantage of what is there. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's a really important constituency, the, the, the Air Charter Association are covering. I mean, these are the, the, the international, now, you know, really global um, group of, of, of brokers and, and operators. And uh, we just want to make sure that they can, you know, at, at least uh, on, on any given day, because we're providing them with a, with a daily updated view of global business aviation activity, so that they can keep the, the, the finger on the pulse and, and, and essentially in this very, you know, unusual period, uh, see when green shoots are starting to come back into the market. Because I think that that's what that's what we all need. We need to see, okay, there there is so called a new normal, uh, mm-hmm. and this is where the demand is coming back, and that's perhaps how I can sort of reorganise my resources to to make the most of that. So mm-hmm. that that's the idea, you know, behind a partnership. Obviously, great for wings. Um, you know, the ACA is such a such a good organisation. It's, it's great endorsement for us to be involved, and and hopefully good for good for their members. Perfect. Okay. Well, once again, Richard, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. There's so much ground to cover at the moment. It's hard to know where to begin and end it. But if we may, we'll come back to you in a few weeks when we're officially in summer and uh, or Northern Hemisphere summer anyway, and just try and uh, make sense of where things are going. But thank you so much for your time. Excellent. I look forward to it. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.